evening. Heavenly Father, we come to you and we thank you for your presence that's here right now. Thank you, the Father, from the youngest to the oldest, God. You have something to speak into our hearts and into our lives. Father, we just prepare our heart for your word. And Father, we say we're here to listen. So Father, I pray that you would speak to us tonight, God. I pray that you would heal us tonight. You would renew us tonight, God. Father, whatever we have need of in you, that Father, we would discover it we would we would enjoy it father we would take it all in and father we just give you all the glory and i just thank you for the young people that are here tonight god i thank you for a move of god in our youth ministry god father you're going to do something you promised in scripture that in the last days you'll pour out your spirit on our sons and our daughters and so father pour your spirit out at city point church uprise youth god and i just thank you for what you're doing and thank you father for the treasure of your children in this house in jesus name do you agree with that? Say amen. amen. Come on, give God some praise. Amen. amen. So good to have the, the students with us tonight. What a blessing to have y'all in the room. Give yourselves a big hand for being here. We're so grateful for Pastor Caesar and Jenny and just what they've done in your lives and what they've done in this church. Pastor Caesar's not here tonight because he's in Alabama looking for youth interns for us. But uh, if you could, turn around and say hi to everybody around you. And then Young people, everybody, take your seats. Well, I, I am so excited that you showed up here for our, our first annual midweek service. Our first ever, sorry, not annual. And uh, I'm excited to preach. I was excited just preparing this message. And uh, I'm excited to share it with you tonight. And uh, for the young people, I'd like to give you something, if I could, um, something that I wish somebody would have told me when I was your age. Number one, disobey your insecurities. Whatever they are, disobey them. Don't listen to them. Um, young man on the third row, the second chair, what's your name? Corson? Carson. Carson. Well, man, I'll tell you this. No matter what the world tells you need to be or whatever the reason they say you can't, don't believe them. Uh, believe in God. Believe in what he placed in you. Believe in the purpose of God in your life. The second thing I'd say this is don't listen to your own excuses. You're going to be tempted in life to uh, make excuses for yourself of why you can't. You're going to be like, oh, I'm too young. I'm a girl. I'm a guy. I'm in junior high. Whatever the excuse is. I don't have enough money. I come from too much money. I don't have a good parent. Whatever that excuse is, disobey your insecurities and don't listen to your excuses. And you'll skip many years of wishing you could change some things. And so that's for free. You can take it if you want. If not, I said it anyway. So anyway, let me, let me share this with you all. And I, I think this is a message for everybody tonight. And this comes from the life of Elisha. And this is the tail end of Elisha's life. And Elisha was a man of miracles everywhere he went. He was trained by Elijah. And what's interesting is that this life filled with the miraculous. And even his death was miraculous. In other words, he, when he died, the scripture says that when they buried him, there was a man there in battle on the way, and they're on the run, and they threw a body on his bones, and that bones of Elisha resurrected him. And even though Elisha had a ministry of miracles, and even though his death had miracles, Scripture records that he dies of an illness. And it's one of the most curious things to me. It's the ministry of the miraculous. It's in some ways we look at God and think that we sometimes have him all figured out, but we don't. And there's some things I think in Scripture, some things in life that just don't make sense. But even in this moment we're going to look at with Elisha, that as he's looking at his life, that he had no regrets. He had no bitterness towards God. In fact, what we're going to look at is the very last prophetic word that he ever gave in his life. And that's in 2 Kings 13. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to that. Um, it's 2 Kings chapter 13. And uh, I'll turn to it too and we'll read it together. Or I'll read it to you. Um, it says this. Now Elisha had been suffering from illness from which he died. Jehosh, the king of Israel, went down to see him and wept over him. He said, My father, my father, he cried, the chariots and the horsemen of Israel. Elisha said, Get a bow and some arrows. And arrows. And he said, Take the bow in your hands, he said, to the, and to the king of Israel. And when he had taken it, Elisha put it in his hands and on the king, in the king's hands. And he said, Open the east window, he said, and he opened it. Shoot, Elisha said, and he shot. 
And the Lord's arrow of victory, uh, victory over Aram, Elisha declared. You'll be completely destroyed, the Arams. Uh, Ar- Armenia, sorry, Armenia, Ar- sorry, I can't talk tonight. It's Wednesday. I, my, mouth, my mouth normally doesn't work till Sunday. Uh, Armenians at Aphek. And then he said, take the hold of the arrows. Now he shot one of the arrows, but he had multiple arrows. And he said, the king took them, and Elisha told him, strike the ground. So he struck it three times, and then he stopped. And the man of God was angry with him, and he said, you should have struck the ground five or six times. And then you would have defeated Aram and had completely destroyed it. But now you'll def- only defeat it three times. And as I read this scripture, this scripture has always haunted me as, as just one who's a follower of God and wanted to do the will of God in my life, that this man literally left something on the table. He knew he was an atmosphere of prophecy. He knew it was an atmosphere where God was working. And when God said, hey, take these arrows, peeking through the prophet, and he began to hit them on the ground, that he did not really push any further. He just kind of hit it one, two, three. And I don't know if it was doubt. I don't know what, it, maybe it seemed foolish to him for him to do this. But when he did not keep striking the ground, God said, well, that's it. You're not going to be in total victory in this area. You'll never totally defeat these enemies. He asked small and he received small. God opened up the, the bank, uh, the vault of heaven and said, take what you want. Take anything out of it you want. Hit these arrows until you empty the account in heaven. And he only hit it three times. In other words, what this man was a part of was something that we see in Scripture. It was an enacted prophecy. And what does that mean is that his participation in it would help produce the outcome in it. That God in that moment was saying, I want to draw you into this. I want you to participate in this. And and that's why I think it's for us as adults, for the young people, is that they are going to be at points in their life where God says, I'm going to give you an opportunity and I will go as far as you want to go in this area in your life. If you dream big, I will work big in your life. If you dream small, then you'll live small. And then the idea that there is an inactive prophecy, that there is something that God placed on the ground, and he said, just keep striking the ground, strike the ground till the very tips of the arrows break off. Just keep asking and pursuing what I have for you, even if it seems foolish, even if you don't fully understand the connection between what I have for you and what you're doing. If I've asked you to do it, then do it with all of your heart and do it till you can't do it anymore. There's another story by Elisha. It's in 2 Kings, and this time it's in chapter 4. And this is the same, same, same idea, just a different person. He says this. Elisha replied to her, and there was a prophet to, or a, a widow that was running out of food. It was a famine. And so she began to basically make provisions for her son and her to die. And so Elisha shows up at her house, and he begins to ask her questions about what he can do for her. And here it is in 4.2. It says this. Elisha replied to her, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? So once again, just like the king, he said, what do you have in your hand that God can use? Because I'll tell you this, God will never ask you for something you don't already possess. Now, you may not see the value in it. You may not see the power in it. Um, You know, watching the the young ladies up here singing, like, who knew probably five years ago that that's the gift that they would have in their life. But they surrendered that gift. And look what God's using in their life. You never know the value. So the prophet says, well, what do you have? What can God work with? She said this, tell me what you have in your home. Your servant has nothing here at all. That was her response. I don't don't have anything except a smart jar of olive oil. And Elisha said, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask just for a few. That was the request. If you want oil, that's what you have a little bit of, then why don't we go make some more? So go ask, but not just for a few. Then go inside, shut the door behind you. You and your sons pour oil into the jars as each is filled, put, one, put that one to the side. And she left him, and she shut the door behind her and her sons, and they brought the jars to her, and she kept pouring. From that little jar that she said it's nothing, she kept pouring oil into these other jars. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another one. But he replied, there's not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. And she went and told the man of God, and he said, go and sell the oil, pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left over. Once again, we see they were involved in the prophecy God was giving them. They, if she would have had a hundred more jars, or if she was still pouring, if she could be alive today and she was still pouring, there would still be olive oil coming out of that city. She would have her own business right now. She'd be on Instagram marketing it right now. <laughs> but it was just the jars. The only limit was how far she was willing to push that limit with God. And and I know I'm going to have to dig through some 
kind of crusty ideas about ourselves in this mind because none of us see ourselves unlimited. None of us see the potential of what we have. We see a handful of arrows and be like, yeah, one, two, three, okay, cool. That's what God's going to do. We'll just keep living. But what if God actually means that in our life? What if he says, what if I want to do more? What if if we did go collect 100 extra jars and say, God, do something with this? I have a greater dream even though there's limitations to it. I I remember when we started CP or City Point and, and we decided to raise money. We didn't raise money and buy the equipment. We didn't need two trailers to take care of 42 people. We needed that in hopes of hundreds of people would one day show up and call it home. Those were the jars stepping out on what God asked us to do. In our lives, all of us have a place that that, that we begin with. And So let me start with this very first point. That every miracle, every breakthrough in your life, every dream in your life starts with a cat, has a catalyst of an action. No matter how young or old you are, somewhere right now, God has put something on the inside of you. Or maybe you're still living in the middle of it. There's always a catalyst to that action. Sometimes people passively blame God, and they go, well, I'm waiting on God. God very rarely makes us wait. Now, for some things, yes. But I think in some moments of our life, we use that as an excuse because we're unwilling to do the catalyst. We're unwilling to get the jars. We're unwilling to hit the arrows in our life. God makes the promise, I'll provide, but we have to gather the jars. I'll give you the victory. Miracles start with the catalyst action in our lives. I remember when Julie and I first got married, and this is back before they pushed credit cards down your throat. Like my, my children before they were out of high school were getting credit card applications. They're like, get in debt, get in debt, you know. And back in the day, when, then Julie and I would use layaway. And that's how we'd go Christmas shopping and buy everything we wanted. And we'd go stick it and go make payments on it. She'd be like, don't forget, Eddie, i got to pay for layaway. And that was our stuff hanging out there in that back room. And it's always such a joy. We actually sometimes would forget what we bought on layaway. It would take us that long. And we'd be like, look what we got the kids for Christmas. But a lot of times the promises of God are like that. They're on layaway with our name on it. Just waiting for that catalyst of action in our life to unlock those miracles in that move. James put it this way. In the same way, faith by itself, not accomplished by action, is just dead. It's a dream. It's, you might as well go to Disneyland and want to be a princess. See, what's, what, see what happens, right? Faith with no actions, it's dead. Dream to be a princess, dead, right? But then he goes on, he says, but someone will say, you have faith and I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I'll show you my faith by my deeds. We have to have a catalyst for everything that God has for us. I remember I had a church member text me on Sunday and they just shared this story of joy about how they took a step of faith to start a certain kind of small group that they just never thought they could be used to do. And not only do people register for their group, but, but, but it's beginning and they're already excited about it. What was the catalyst? They put their name on a list and people showed up. They put a jar out and God filled that jar. Don't be surprised if we're hitting the ground with those arrows and putting the jar out there that God doesn't stop by and fill those things up in our life. So my question as we move through this message tonight is what is that thing that you're believing God for? Maybe you're in the middle of it. I'm still in the middle of the miracle God's working on in my life. I've been in the middle of it since I found out there were miracles. I've been asking for some things as long as I've learned how to ask for things. But I'm still watching God at work and God's still putting catalysts of of action in my hands. The second thing is the catalyst is often a shadow of the answer. For the oil, for her, it was more jars. For the king, it was more arrows for battle. For those who sow, you, you, God says, for you want harvest, you want seed. There was a couple in a, in a church, and we used to serve with her, her, Julie's dad, and they were having fertility issues, and they couldn't have a child. And one day in church, the Holy Spirit laid on their heart to go decorate a nursery as if they were having a baby soon. So they decorated that room And that place became an altar of prayer for that couple. It became a place, a catalyst of hope. And I'm not saying everybody has to do that, but that's what the Holy Spirit laid on their heart. And one day that baby was born, and one day that baby laid in that nursery that that couple, out of the obedience of the Holy Spirit, had a catalyst of action that took place. And that catalyst of action for them was a nursery, even though they were told they could never have children. It was a shadow of what they were believing God for. I I told you all a couple Sundays ago, you and I were made a pledge for believe, and the Holy Spirit laid a number on our heart. The way we always work is we pray about it separately, and then I always just pray Julie has a lower number. Um, but, but she didn't. We had the same number. And I knew it was out of our fi- family's financial budget to meet it. I knew that somewhere when I wrote that number down, I said either I'm a liar or a miracle's on its way. And a couple Sundays ago, God put some resources in my hands that were outside of our family budget, 
And I got it. I was excited about it. I, I already had a plan of what to do with it. And he said, you know what that is? I was like, yeah, I know what it is. I already found it online. I'm going to. He said, that's your believe money. And I was like, I believe that. And uh, so the next Sunday, I put it in an envelope and came and brought it. It was a shadow of what he spoke. That's how God works. I've learned many times in our life that God always requires a seed if we want to see a harvest in the area, whether it's building a nursery, striking arrows, or getting jars of oil, whether it's leading worship on a Wednesday night or serving as an usher and just saying, God, I want you to use my life. All of our jars look different, but all of them lead us towards the miracle and the purposes of God in our life. 2 Corinthians 9 says this, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly, but whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Whoever hits those arrows just three times, don't expect a full breakthrough. If you want a full harvest, just keep banging them until the prophet finally says, you can stop. How many jars? You just keep going block to block. I'm sure when that lady, you know, was out there asking for jars, they're probably like, you know, Judy finally lost it. Like, she's out <laughs> asking for jars. She only has a little bit of oil. We all know. She talked about it in, in small group yesterday, you know. <laughs> and there she was. Hey, I need some oil jars. I need some oil jars. I, I, there's a harvest coming my way in my life. I remember when the, you know, when the Holy Spirit led us to a place of in, in January of 2022. I'm just going to share some stories that with y'all, just testimonies of what I've seen God do in this area. And I remember I was praying one day, praying over the auditorium, and Holy Spirit said, y'all need to go to three services. And so I checked our numbers. I said, no, nah, we're good. We're totally fine. We can wait a little bit longer. We need about this percentage more people, and then we can do it. He said, no, y'all need to do it. So we talked to our pastors and our team and leaders and everybody, at least smiled at me like they were supportive. They are probably thinking, we don't need to do this. And, but I, I knew it in my heart. It was my jar of oil. And it's not that I believe that you build it, they will come. But I do know there's scripture that if you put a jar out, God will fill it. And I don't really know what to do with those two things, but I do know God worked. January, your service yesterday, Sunday, we had over 220 more people in that service than we did two years ago before we started those three services. And so for us as a church, what, what I'm trying to tell Stir your faith with this, is all you may have is an empty jar, but give it to God because he can fill it up. And the third thing is this, a catalyst was designed to stir your faith. In other words, it's an action to make you lean on God, to position you in faith, to win the battles, to fill the jars, say, God, this is it. And I promise you this, when the, when the prophet said to her, hey, go get more empty jars, go get what you need, go get what you need to fill this home in it changed her perspective from how empty her little jar was to how many jars I can get. It changed her expectation and her hope in something. And there's something about when God switches your vision off of your problem into his promises, but that catalyst is what does it for us. So now she stopped worrying about what little she had, but now she wanted to make room for more and start dreaming about what God could do in this moment. And so many times those catalysts, those little steps, those little seeds, the striking of the arrows, whatever that is, coming to youth on a Wednesday night, whatever that thing is, is a catalyst that God uses that to stir and to shift your faith. It refocused her faith from the problem to the miracle she, she had. She began to expect. When Jesus was, went to go, uh, when Jesus' friend Lazarus died, and what we understand by Scripture is that he intentionally let him die. He went to go roll away the stone, and, and this is, it's actually recorded in John eleven thirty nine. 39. It says, take away the stone. The Lord said, Martha, the sister of the dead man. I love that's how they describe him, just dead. He's just dead. By this time, she says, there's a bad odor. But they've been there for four days. He said, that stone represents a miracle. She said, no, it represents an odor. It's really how they both saw it differently. One, he, Jesus saw the stone as a barrier to a miracle, and she saw it as a, a barrier to smell. It's, they saw the same thing, but they saw it differently. Jesus saw it as a catalyst to stir faith. And so what did he tell her? He wanted her to understand that that stone rolling away is not something that bad's about to happen. That stone rolling away is not that something bad, your brother's dead, and it's going to only now we get to smell him being dead. Because I mean, that would be a horrible pastoral move. Like, hey, not only is your loved one passed away, but let's go see what's happening in the tomb. No, it was provoking her faith. And he was said, and this is what he said when he, he did that. The next verse is, then Jesus said, did I not tell you if you would believe that you'll see the glory of God? Here's the catalyst. Let it stir your faith. Stop work thinking that he is dead. But what if he's resurrected behind this stone? What if, what if this simple movement that you're taking, this obedience, this step, this prayer, the reading the Bible, the starting a small group, coming to church every week, whatever that is, what if there's a miracle behind it instead of another problem behind it? 
What if you see your life and those opportunities? And I know God stretched our faith at times. We're like, God, we can't do that. We can't afford it. We don't have the time for that. I don't have the talent for it. Nobody's going to listen to me. But he says, what, what have I told you? Push through that moment in your life and discover all that I have. He did the miracle. That's why God has catalysts. They push our faith and they provoke our faith. And so I'm going to close with this. There's five things that aid us in catalysts for miracles in our life. And the very first thing is prayer. Prayer is the striking of the arrows. Prayer is believing God. Prayer is the moment that Jesus shows up in your heart and in your life. Prayer is the moment that, that, that many times in our life, and I'll say this, if you've been believing God for something for a long time, anybody in that position, sometimes we get lazy. Sometimes we get lackadaisical and go, well, I prayed about it a lot already, so we stop praying about it, and then we just think about it, and then we just blow it off and go, well, maybe God didn't mean that anyway. If God says it, God means it. And heaven and earth will pass away before one promise of God in your life ever will. So let me take you back to the story of Lazarus. It's in John eleven forty one. 41. It says, so they took the stone away, and Jesus, and he looked up and he said, Father, and he said, listen to this. He says, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me. He's letting everybody hear him say this. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you have sent me. And then when he said this, this was his prayer that he prayed about Lazarus. He said, Lazarus, come out. And I love the idea that first you set up the prayer. He says, I just want everybody to know that a miracle is about to take place. I want to invite you into that environment right now that God's about to do something. So then he prayed this prayer of command. He said, Lazarus, come out. And there's something about, I think, the person who's praying about something they know God said that they have a commanding prayer behind them. It's not this wheely, mousy little, oh, God, if you could, if you felt like doing it, if you could just please put an angel on it. I don't deserve it. I know. I'm a creep. I just, I know what I thought yesterday, but uh, please. But there's a, a command behind that prayer. There, there are things that I think we, we come and we petition and we ask God, God, what about it? But when he answers you and he puts a word in your heart, you walk up to that thing and you say, Lazarus, come out. Come on, it's time to flourish in our home. Our marriage is healed. Our kids are serving God. I commanding prayer right now with the authority of the name of Jesus, standing on the firm foundation of the promises of God that outlasts the storms of life. I command this thing to break forth. I command breakthrough in my life. Jesus didn't beg God for anything when he walked up there. He just commanded based on the will that he already knew God was doing. And in church, if you know about it, then stop asking permission to do it. Stop going, well, I know he said it, but God's not stupid like us. He doesn't forget who he is day after one day, and he's a different person the next day. He is consistent seven days a week. You ask him on Monday, it was yes. Then by Friday, it will be yes. You ask him two years later on a Monday, is it still yes? It would still be yes. It would still be the answer that he gave you because God does not change. Matthew 18, 18, I truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth, it'll be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed on heaven. Who's the binding one? Who's the loosing one? You. He says, if you do it, you speak to it. You step into it. If you take that devil on, stop laying down for that devil. Stop being like, uh, stand up to it. I mean, call down heaven and cuss at the devil, but get something done. And just say, God, this is what I desire. Again, truly, I tell you that if two of you on earth, that's why we have our prayer team down here, agree about anything they ask for, it will be done by them for my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered, he says, I'm right there with them. God is in your prayers. It is a catalyst for God to move. But pray the kind of prayer like, that doesn't offend God. It would offend me if I said, hey, come over to the house for my dinner, and I fix you a good steak or a brisket. Boy, that sounds good. And, and I fixed it for you, and then you sat down, and I gave you your plate, and you're like, is it okay if I take a bite of this? I'm like, no, you're too stupid. Get out of my house. Like, if I, put it on, if I put it in front of you and I said, you're my guest at my house, I expect you to eat all of it, and if you can't, take home a doggy bag. If you don't like it, throw it away at your house, not mine. Because it's an invitation from him. Act like it's an invitation, not a test. Say, yes, God. Second thing is this. We've already talked about a little bit. Actions. Actions are catalysts for move of God in your life. What steps are you supposed to take? 
Do you know what those steps are? Have you written those steps down? Are you doing anything with them? What's the step God has for you? Know what that step is. Like I told the young people, embrace your insecurities. Stop listening to your excuses. Just say, God, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I don't care what it looks like, God. I'm stepping out in it. Then third thing, and this may sound simple, but your attitude. It is so powerful. The longer I live, the more I work with people, the more powerful I realize attitudes are. There are people I won't ask to do something just because I'm like, I know the attitude. I'd rather do it myself. Because at least I won't talk back to myself. I'll be like, yeah, you can. Yeah, you can. I'm not, yeah, I can get it done. All right, let's do this then. I was talking to myself last night. Julie goes, what would you say? I said, nothing. I was just having a conversation. She goes, well, what about? I said, it's private. It's between me and myself. <laughs> I'm not inviting you to this conversation. If I wanted you to be a part of it, I would have said, hey, Julie. But I didn't. I said, hey, Eddie, let's go in the kitchen and talk for a minute. I'm off my meds, so y'all will help me. Um, don't let enemies so trash into your soul. Don't give yourself permission to think on thoughts that don't build you up and lead you towards your future. Don't, it may be easy in the moment. It may be easy in the moment to think bad about yourself and to compare yourself to others. And that, Yeah, it's junk food for the soul. It's easy to do. It doesn't take a lot of hard. It's not hard work to do that, but don't. Watch your self-talk. I love this story in Genesis. It was before... Now, Sarah, Sarah and Abraham were just, their names were changed. But listen to this. I love it. It says, I will surely return to you this time next year. This is Genesis 18.10. Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now, uh, Sarah was listening at the entrance of the tent, which was behind him. So she's behind him there out there talking. And Abraham and Sarah were already very old. I love how scripture always reminds us of that. They are very old, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. And Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, I'm a worn out and my Lord is old. But now I have the, will I have this pleasure? That was her self-talk. You, you really think it's going to happen? Like, have y'all seen us? I'm old and my Lord, I mean, King Dad over here, he's way too old to have a baby. And then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, will I have a child now that I'm this old? So God calls, talks to Abraham. He goes, your wife in the tent over there, why is she thinking these thoughts? Why is she laughing in her heart about what we're talking about right here? God says, is anything too hard for the Lord? I'll return to you. Let me remind you of the promise I made on the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, and she lied. She said, I did not laugh. But God said, yeah, you did. <laughs> Kind of remind, okay, it's Wednesday, so I'm going to say this. Reminds me of the movie Elf, where he says, you call, me Elf, you call me Elf one more time. You know, anyway, if you haven't seen it, and then, anyway, sorry. <laughs> I'll, I'll use movie clips next, Wednesday, next time we do this. But I just love that God said, yeah, you did. You laughed. You said, this ain't going to happen. I know what comes out of your mouth, and I also know what's floating through your head. Problem is, Sarah, that's what you think is the truth. Because what the truth is, verse 14, I'm coming back in a year and you're going to have a crying little baby in your hands. Watch your thoughts. Don't let that trash get in your soul. Your heart is soil that will grow anything, whether it's good or bad. You fill it with a bunch of bad thoughts, a bunch of bad things are going to grow. You fill it with a bunch of good things, a bunch of good things will grow. God created us to grow things. That's the way we were made. This takes discipline in our life. And to be honest, there's dreams in your heart. That even I, in my, at this point in my life, I'm still fighting for dreams. And I look at certain things and I think, and my mind says, I don't know about this one, Eddie. But I'm like, yep, God said it. I don't care if it's the last thing I do. I'm going to stand on my feet and there's a couple things I'm going to see with my eyes. I know it in my heart. I'm not worried about it anymore. Throw a heart transplant. Try to kill me. Let me lose my hair. I don't care. I'm still going to see it. God's that good. God knew then everything about you right now. You say, well, Eddie, things have changed in my life. I've gotten older. I've, you know, we've lost us financially, this, and all this going on. So I don't see how that's going to come. God knew that when he said that to you. God is not limited by time. So he can look 20 years into your future and remind you of a word that he dropped off when you were a young person and say, this is what I'm going to do, and he'll still do it. And young people, I want to tell you right now, there are dreams that God planted in my heart when I was your age that I am walking out today. Never underestimate. People may tune out around you, but those of you who tune in to God, 
God's going to speak to you and God is going to use you because that's who God is. And I would even say for now, what I would say, listen the best you can now because those words will guide you the rest of your life. There were things I said no to because of what I heard when I was your age. Never underestimate God's voice in your life. The fourth thing is this, our D is this, is relationships. We need brotherhoods and sisterhoods that help us, that we lean on, that encourage us. It's more than somebody who, you know, loves the football team. Like, I love John, but I hate the Eagles, but I love John. So it's more than that. There's, there's spiritual relationships and connections. I've got past that. I was offended for years and just couldn't even look at him in church. I was like, Lord, I bless him. Bless those who curse me. Hopefully he's in but I'm over it now, John. I'm over it. Last Sunday was proof. I'm over it. That's why it took so long. I had to get over the eagles. Um, but we see in Scripture, when David was called to be king and, his, and Saul, the king who was, went to oppress and to murder King David, God raised up a Jonathan to help David get through that tough moment in his life. And I'm convinced of this. In the house of God, there are Jonathans to every David. And when you find that, it's, a, it's deeper than what do we like to do. It's a spiritual connection that you, God puts us and he binds us together and he links us together. And you can share your heart and your broken heart and your dreams, but you stand each other up and you kick each other in the rear and say, let's get up. You're going to do this. God's going to show up in your life. First Samuel says this, go in peace. We have sworn friendship with each other in the name of the Lord. We need relationships, godly relationships that give you godly advice. If they're not going towards God, then why are you listening to them going the wrong direction? If I was on a road trip and somebody's going the other side, I wouldn't ask them, hey, do you, you know, how do I get to here? No, they're heading another direction. Find people that are walking the same direction as you. And then the last thing I'll share and then we'll close is this, is detail. Do you know what you're asking for? You need details. Don't say, well, whatever God has for me. I'm just going to bang this arrow three times and if something shows up, cool, I don't care. God needs your detail because that detail is your faith. That detail is what, what shows what you're trusting God for. Julie, for my birthday, she said, I want to take you to dinner. What do you want? I said, I want a steak, medium rare. I want rolls with butter. I want pecan pie for dessert. I want potatoes, right? And I want a side of creamy horseradish to go with that steak, and I want an iced tea. That is what I want. And so when I walked in the restaurant, I did not go, what do you want? And they're like, I don't know, whatever you want. I said, I want it this way. And I promise you, if it's not right, I don't normally send it back, but it's my birthday. I'm sending it back. <laughs> Sometimes we pray these be nice, not so smart prayers. And we just, whatever you want, Jesus. He put it in your heart. It's in there. You get frustrated about it. You talk about it. You dream about it. Why not talk to the only one who can actually do it for you? Tell him what you want. You say, what if I set the bar too high? I don't personally think you can with God. And even if it is too high, he'll give you something better for the better reason. And you'll see why he did it the way he did it. There were things I asked for that the, I was way over here. The idea was right. The concept was right. But the timing was way off. So God says, the timing's not right. But I'm going to do this. And when it finally shows up, you're going to be so happy when it shows up in your life. You're going to thank me for it. You're not going to miss anything. And I'm telling you, for some of y'all in this room, you need to draw a picture of it. You need to write it down. You need to stick it on a mirror. Y'all need to have prayer. Pray over it every year. Don't let go of it. Give God some detail. Let him know. 1 John 5. This is the confidence we have approaching God that if we ask anything according to his will, he'll hear us. If we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we've asked of him. What are you asking God for? What does it look like? What's that dream that God placed in your heart? I'm not, you know, talking about after you look at Instagram for a half hour and be like, oh, yeah, I want to do that. I'm talking about a God thing that clicks in your spirit that when you get around something like that, it's like, oh, that's what I want. And to be honest with you, sometimes I, in my walk with faith and believing God, sometimes I get around what I want, a version of it, and I get discouraged because they had it. And I'll be like, I want that. I don't know. They look way smarter than me. I don't know how I'm going to do that. And God said, they're just as dumb as you, Eddie. But I make them look smart. I'm sorry, I've said dumb a lot tonight. In the mornings, I normally don't say all these words. But by evening, dumb comes out a lot. Sometimes we look at other people's lives and think, wow, they're so much more worthy of what God gave them. They're just as unworthy as you, but God is just as good to everybody. 
You've got to have a conviction about God's goodness and stop having a conviction about how bad you are. That's a great conviction to have when you come to the place of salvation and you repent of your sins and make him your Lord and Savior. From that day forward, you are a blood-bought child of God. You are grafted into the family of God, and there is a boldness that God wants to arise in you. You, you cry out, Daddy, God, God, this is what I need. And young person, God hears that prayer no matter how young you are. You pray to your Daddy, God, even if your earthly parents cannot deliver it, your heaven Heavenly Father can. God listens. Amen. Let's stand. I had fun. I don't know about y'all. Holy Spirit's working in this room today. He's working in their hearts tonight. There's a move of God in some of your lives. It's more than just checking in and being at church. God's stirring you. God's provoking you. God's calling you. There's people in this room that, that God laid on my heart a couple years ago. There's people in your room that are financially going to be far different in a few years than they are now. Some of you have that dream. And I know pastors shouldn't, people get uncomfortable when pastors talk about this, but there's some kingdom world changers that are in this room that God's put a dream about business and stuff in your heart. Even though money can be used corruptly in our world, if you can use it also for the glory of God. But there's people with callings of ministry in this room, and you think God's looked past you, and, over, and, and, and that door will never open. That door is going to open sooner than what you think. You are treasure vessels walking around this planet. You need to let God pull that treasure out of you. Say, God, I stir that faith in my spirit. God, I activate this thing. What do I need to do? And I promise you, he will. So let's just lift our hands to heaven. <sighs> Holy Spirit, show up in this place beyond signs confirming God. Father, set people free, breakthroughs in this room, Father. Father, I thank you for gifts, Lord. Spirit of faith, Father, rise up in some, God. Just a breakthrough in their heart. Holy Spirit, be poured out in our lives. And Father, I pray for those of us in this room that are in that position, striking those arrows, gathering those jars, that, Father, we'll have a tenacity of faith, Father, that you called us to do, that, Father, we'll get back to gathering jars for those who paused it, for those who've gotten weary, those who've allowed that their, their self-talk to bring them down, God. The Father, they'll go back to your word, go back to your promises, Father, I just pray for a spirit of faith in our church, God, that you would be poured out, that, Father, we would just have a, uh, just an unconventional trust in you, God, that, Father, we'd start to see things break loose, that men would say are impossible, but you begin to do, that you would get all the glory. Father, I just thank you for that. I just thank you for that tonight, God. Be poured out in this place. In Jesus' name. In just a moment, our prayer team's going to be down here, and, and there's some people in this room that you need just unconventional faith for what God's about to do in your life. You need, you need a, I don't want, you, you need like some nitro. You need something, you need like a five-shot latte in your spirit right now. There, there's something there on the edge of your life, and you've lived right at the edge of it. And God says, you're, I'm calling you to something deeper. And if that's you, in just a moment, our prayer team's going to be down here. Let them pray with you. Let us serve you those five shots of spiritual espresso Get you moving into what God has for you. Before we do that, let's let's uh, with every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here tonight and you don't know Jesus, He loves you so much. He knows that you've sinned. He knows that you failed. But God so loved the world, He gave His only Son. Whoever believes in Him would not perish, but have everlasting life. This is an invitation to eternal life. This is an invitation to relationship with God. I don't care how bad things have messed up. God is a restorer of broken souls. You're here in this room tonight, and I'm going to have everybody pray this prayer, but you say, Pastor, that prayer is specifically for me. If that's you, can you lift your hand tonight? Can I see who you are? Amen. Amen. If that's you, raise your hand high. I don't care how young you are, young man. You're fine raising your hand. Amen. Let's pray with those who lifted their hands. Everybody say this after me. Say, Heavenly Father, I ask that you forgive me of my sins. I ask you to be the Lord of my life. And I choose to follow you with all of my heart from this day forward. Thank you for loving me and thank you for forgiving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give God some praise to those who made that prayer. Amen.
For those who prayed that prayer, a couple things. Number one, get water baptized. We're doing it in just a few weeks. It's an outward expression of the decision you just made. Uh, there's a cute card in the back of your seat. You can fill that out, drop it in the offering bucket, and we'll contact you, give you more information about it. Even if you're not even really sure what it is, we'd love to help you through that, help you understand God even better, to help you take that next step. Second thing is get in church as often as you can. Everybody's got a busy life, but one thing Scripture says is put me first in that busy life. He says, give me the first of your week. Give me, give me the first day, and I'll bless the rest of it. A lot of us are carrying things we shouldn't because we don't live the way God called us to live. So put God first in your life. God's going to show up. But don't just show up. Get involved. Put down roots. Get, get in a small group. Serve. Live God's life, God's best for you. And then the third thing, our prayer team's going to be down here in just a second. Just let them pray with you and welcome you in. Be maybe two, three minutes at the most. But we'd love, we're excited that you made that decision tonight. Last thing we're going to do is we're going to give as we always do on Sunday. For those giving cash or checks, there's envelopes in the back of your seat. Uh, for those giving cards, there's a QR code over my shoulder. So the ushers are going to pass the buckets, and then I will pray. Um, Y'all go ahead and pass them, and I'll pray over our offering. Um, we have a leadership event coming up uh, next Saturday uh, for all the point team in the afternoon, and I think it starts at 1. 1? One to three, and I'm going to kind of preach a part two to this message. And so whether you serve or not, if you're interested in serving, just come and be a part of it. And it's going to be a really great afternoon. We want to build up those who build the house of God. And so we can't wait to share that time with you uh, coming next Saturday. But obviously we'll have church on Sunday, and we'll continue our series. Uh, so you lead, uh, 17th, and there's a QR code right there in the middle. See the shiny object right above that is a QR code, and uh, it'll take you. To register for that, but we'd love to know you're coming, and it's going to be a great night. So let me pray over our offering that our prayer team's going to down here, and if the Holy Spirit's working, I know you got to go, but don't walk out of the room with God working in your heart. Let God work. Let God seal it into your heart. You never know. We're two or more together praying God works. So our prayer team will come down here while I'm praying, uh, and if we need help, pastors, please fill in the gaps. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word tonight. Thank you for the opportunity to give and to worship you with what you blessed us with, God. You are God of more than enough. I thank you that we can trust you with everything that we have. We love you. You're in love with us. And I just pray that we fill your presence in an amazing way. In Jesus' name, amen.